think uh, that that was a excellent array of uh, the pictures were really excellent of the meibomian glands and gave us insights into how now the treatment has completely changed we also need to look at how the meibomian glands uh, you know behave uh, should we go to the next talk yes, yes. Okay, sir? okay so the next talk while we are still on the dry eye topic is going to be by dr uh, monica jethani and she's going to be talking about hyperosmolarity in dry eye Monica, your slides are on. Just make it full full screen and go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just a second. Thank you so much, uh, Namrata, ma'am, and the whole AIUS team for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So, uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, hyperosmolarity in dry eye. We all know that dry eye is uh, increasing a lot nowadays. and due to lockdown and use of uh, multiple gadgets everybody almost nowadays kids are also facing the problem of dry eye so uh, we will be discussing about the role of hyperosmolarity in dry eye so the key mechanism in dry eye disease is how does osmolarity actually occur we all know that uh, tear film is made up of three layers mucin aqueous and lipid so when the aqueous layer becomes less when the production is less or the evaporation is more the solutes in the tear film increase leading to hyperosmolarity which in turns because there is lot of solutes there is lot of hyperosmolarity it causes damage to the juvenile epithelial cells when the juvenile epithelial cells are damaged they lead to apoptosis the cell start dying once the juvenile cells die it leads to the nerve stimulation because nerves are just below that so it leads to the nerve stimulation which in turn leads to inflammation which uh, dr paras mehta will be discussing in detail now this inflammation leads to activation of mmp uh, pathway and this in turn leads to globulet cell uh, loss so in this vicious cycle what we have understood is that it affects all the layers of Uh, the tear film, which is because of goblet cell loss, there is there will be the defect in mucin, aqueous was deficient, and the tear film. So there are multiple factors which can uh, result in tear film instability. Uh, to name a few, blepharitis, uh, topical drugs, allergy, contact lens, LASIK surgery, ocular surgeries, systemic drugs, and so on. so with this we have understood that actually there is a vicious cycle the way you know the cycle wheel rotates similarly because of all these processes like that is hyperosmolarity apoptosis and inflammation a vicious dry eye cycle is initiated so what we now need to do is how do we break uh, this cycle so for that we need to first look at the normal ocular surface so in this we can see that it's a very clean neat intact lipid layer is there and there is adequate aqueous tear production so the aqueous molecules are entering inside whereas if we look at the other slide which is the dry eye pathology there is tear film instability whereas the lipid layer is deficient and so the uh, to maintain the hyperosmolarity the water is sucked from inside to out so it goes on increasing the tear hyperosmolarity goes on increasing increasing and the it reaches a stage where the epithelial cells also become hyperosmolar and thus they also start shedding the water molecules so normally if we talk about in a normal individual the tear osmolarity is around 300 which increases to around 360 in dry eye patient it also goes up to spikes up to 800 to 900 in the center of the cornea but because this is a study the uh, the samples are not taken from the center of the cornea so in this it says that it goes up to 360 osmoles so after having understood that the hyperosmolarity is the key 
the tear film instability occurs because of tear film evaporation and aqueous tear deficiency hyperosmolarity there are uh, mainly two types first there is tear hyperosmolarity later on it leads to epithelial cell hyperosmolarity also inflammation paris ma'am will be discussing in detail and apoptosis of the cells lead to globulet cell loss and dysfunction and meibomian gland dysfunction so now after having understood what is the process which goes on in the dry eye disease how do we treat it so the role of hypotonic solutions is a transient it it gives you a relief but it is a transient relief so what do we need to do we need to add some compatible solutes like which are the naturally occurring compatible solutes in our tear film like methylamine small carbohydrates like trehalose polyols like glycerol erythritol amino acids like taurine so we have added all these into a uh, drop form now what is the possible role how do they act and how do they bring back the hyperosmolarity to normal so first thing is they maintain the cell volume and there is reduction in inorganic solute load it also provides osmo protection which stabilizes the protein and other osmo sensitive macromolecules maintaining functionality of the protein under environmental stresses there are few more uh, cytoprotective effects which which these compatible solutes offer and they are antioxidant property redox balancing in hypoxic conditions sulfide detoxification and calcium modulation so uh, when it is about uh, referral the whole talk is about referral so uh, this is the tier lab which will not be available at uh, all the centers because this is pretty expensive so if you really want to know the osmolarity of your patients there is no clinical uh, study that can tell you that uh, how to measure the uh, hyperosmolarity so if you are in such a city where you have a tier lab facility you can always refer your patients and get the osmolarity done though it's not a mandatory thing to be done so coming to the key messages dry eye disease is an inflammatory process triggered by tear film instability and tear hyperosmolarity anti inflammatory agents are indicated for moderate to severe dry eye unrelieved by topical lubricants first step is topical lubricants if if still the patient is uncomfortable we can add anti inflammatory agents but corticosteroids and tetracycline are effective anti inflammatory agents but the long term use must be weighed against the risk of potential adverse effect so it can only be used for a very short duration and not for a very long duration so what do we do cyclosporin is a very good option in uh, such severe dry eye uh, patients so in conclusion dry eye is a significant condition with an increasing incidence ocular surface damage may be present even in presence of a normal tear film and untreated dry eye disease has serious consequences even amounting to vision loss secondary to ocular surface damage it can also increase the risk of infections in the cornea because tear has uh, anti uh, anti infective properties and efficacy of conventional tears in today's uh, practice is very limited Osmot osmotically regulated tear preparation help repair the ocular surface damage and improve the quality of life of dry eye disease patients so tear hyperosmolarity uh, cell utilizes short term inorganic solute uptake and long term compatible solutes regulatory mechanism to maintain the osmotic balance hypotonic solutions provide only transient relief from tear hyperosmolarity compatible solutes help restore the tear film osmolarity provide osmo protection from the environmental stress and have other cytoprotective effects on the ocular surface epithelia incorporating compatible solutes with different kinetic property in one solution may be more effective in protecting patients from dry eye disease thank you so much